Secular Humanist Association. Follow a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect individuals' right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello folks, thanks for watching us. I'm Harry Greenberger and I want to do something that I should do a lot more often. I want to thank Larry Perkins, who is our one-man tech technician here producing this show, and Larry has been doing this for us for many, many years, uh, and uh, he has to, he, he's a one-man operator. So Larry, we thank you, and, and, and we always thank you. Um, I think most of you may know that our show can be seen in addition to Cox Cable Channel 76 on YouTube, Vimeo, and on the NOSHA homepage. Well, uh, as you also know, we secular humanists, we are not anticipating a, an afterlife. Our position is, this is the only life we're going to have, and just let's live it fully and rewardingly and get what we can out of this life. Now, I never ask my guests whether they are secular or not, and I have not asked my guests now, but I do want to say that Karl Mack fits the description of how we live our lives. If there is anyone who has lived a full, rewarding life and is continuing to do so, it's Karl Mack. Karl, just to get us going, tell us about how you came to be in New Orleans and your early activity here. Okay. Glad. Thank you, Harry, for having me on here. <laughs> um, I think I should go back to my childhood to get, okay. get it explained. Um, I was a hotshot drummer, okay, was drum crazy, playing the drums, beat knots and pans. My parents bought me a drum when I was two years old. Uh -huh. I was in love with the Dave Clark Five and the Beatles, and um, they put me in private drum lessons when I was nine at the Eastman School of Music. Okay. I, I grew up in Rochester, New York. I see. So I started at age nine studying percussion with the same teachers that teach at the college level. Um, John Beck, the timpanist for the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, and Will and, Will and Booth. You were how old? Nine. nine. Okay. So by the time I was in high school, I had been in the New York State symphony band playing as timpanist. I was in the Monroe County bands, you know, on these were all that you compete and get judged and then all they right. select the best. So I'd all those kind of things and drumming opportunities all through high school and um, learning how to play keyboard percussion uh, like marimbas, vibes, xylophones. And um, uh, when I was in high school, they had what they called the NISMA, the New York State Music Association does adjudicating and they rank drummers and um, I was top rank in the state. Um, so that set me up as like this child prodigy drummer. Okay. And um, so I didn't want to go to college to study percussion because I didn't want to be what I uh, jokingly called the humdinger of the orchestra, which is the guy <laughs> in the, the orchestra. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ding. Uh, yeah, and right, occasionally yeah. a camera goes over to show you. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. the percussion section in a symphony orchestra is a lot of measure counting. You do a lot of rest. You don't have the lead melody. You exactly. Know? So you really want to study orchestral percussion. And um, so I, I, I was very interested in studying art. 
And I've kind of made a deal with my father that um, he's like, well, you can study art, but I want you to take computer science as well. He started working for IBM at, um, in 1951, right at the ground floor of IBM. So I was studying art, like figure drawing, sculpting, design, things like that, and was, really enjoyed it, loved it. And then also studying all those archaic uh, computer printing languages like Fortran and COBOL and BASIC and Assembler and all those kind of things. So um, that what I, what I ended up doing was going to work in Rochester, New York at a Miller Beer distributing company programming a computer in RPG2. And um, I called it a doodle daydream and draw. Because basically, <laughs> you sit at this computer monitor, and I would be either doodling, daydreaming, or drawing. I could program, and I wrote volumes. I wrote stacks of these um, code to run their reporting programs and the accounting programs and everything for this machine that was probably the size of an automobile and uh, was 64K. All right. So things have really improved right. since then. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so anyways, I saved my money, and I was very diligent about it. I sat there with my CD passbooks for my accounts, yeah. and this was in the 1980s when interest rates were 18%. Uh -huh. So a $10,000 CD was earning you yeah. $1,800 a year, am I doing it right? You're lucky to get 1% now. Right, <laughs> so um, I just saved my money. And um, I wanted to be an artist, and I was so dedicated day after day after day in thought and practice of I could either, I, I wanted to be an artist or a musician, and, uh, but I knew I needed some money in the bank, so I set a $50,000 financial goal. That was my goal, and I thought about that day and, and day out. How am I gonna get there, and what kind of art I'm gonna produce? And so I would spend a lot of time in the library and looking at picture books of uh, New Orleans. I found books about New Orleans. So this is, of course, before the internet, so you had to do your research in the library. Okay. And I looked at that, and I thought, you know, I could make it either in music, because armor, or I could make it in art because the climate is nice. I love doing uh, plein air, you know, outdoor paintings, and I was good at it. I could sketch and render buildings in an hour and have a nice final product. So I thought, um, and it looks European, you know, it had sort of a bohemian thing. So just out of the um, studying in picture books about New Orleans and reading about it, I decided that I would move to New Orleans. So I told my boss after I got my Christmas bonus in 1983. And you, I said, and you I'm made gonna, your requirement of the 50. Yes, wow. I did, I did, I did. So um, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit, I'll give you a month's notice, and um, I'm gonna move to New Orleans. He said, New Orleans, Louisiana? And I said, I thought it was in Mississippi. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I found out it was on the Mississippi River. I had never been further south than Pennsylvania. But I took off in February, I knew about Mardi Gras, I'd read about it, so I timed it right. I came down, I got a little apartment on Esplanade Avenue, $225, between Royal Street and Bourbon Street um, in the 700 block. I found that within 24 hours of getting here, and set out with my easel, and started doing paintings, and just st observed the uh, musicians performing on the street and so forth. And after about six months of doing um, painting, I did, never could figure out how to sell the paintings. It was one thing to paint them, but how are you going to sell them? And, um, but I watched these guys making some money in tip jars, and I thought, you know, I can do that. Why don't I go back up to Rochester and get my marimba? So I drove back up, and I got my three-octave Musser marimba, and I brought it down here and went to Broad Street uh, B. Tat's Bicycle Shop, and we put four bicycle wheels on it, and I painted this whole facade around it, and I hit the streets uh, for the World's Fair in 1984, I was a regular fixture in the French Quarter. I see. Mm -hmm. and, and it provided a, a gum sufficient to live on. Right. I could roll it down the street, down my stairs in my apartment, up to Royal Street and, and perform. So that was a, a very wonderful time. The, the World's Fair brought in great entertainers from around the world. Uh, jugglers and musicians and so forth. And so after that on Jackson Square, there was great camaraderie, and all through the 80s, I was a fixture out there performing, and um, you know, this was before the casinos opened and kind of sucked the tourism away. Everybody had come to the French Quarter. It of had course. just been all from the surrounding states. It was just like a carnival out there every weekend. And um, 
I expanded. I, I realized that I, I could play some private parties, and I got. I started getting in the party planners saw me performing, and I started private parties. But then I realized they didn't always want the xylophone man. Um, sometimes they wanted to have a jazz band. So I thought, well, why don't I become a mime? So I got my little mime <laughs> costume together and, and became a mime. And then I learned how to twist balloons, and I learned how to face paint, and I learned how to do magic and juggle, and I started doing all those things. And then. A couple party a party planners said to me, you know, we want you to be a vendor. Do you know what a vendor is? And I said, uh, well, you mean like the guy that sells the Lucky Dogs? Mm -hmm. and they said, well, yeah, it's sort of like that. But what we want to do is we want to make one phone call to you, and we'll tell you we need a stilt walker and a little person and a sword swallower and a magician, and you can, we recommend, you know, you charge um, charge us say $75 an hour and maybe you pay them like 65 an hour so you make $10 for, for the time and effort of me doing this. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I got my business checking account and I got a, a license to do business and so all through the 90s I was, um, I actually I, I had a uh, New Orleans, the Access Community Access TV show. I don't know if you ever saw the one that was called um, Carl Mack Presents New Vaudeville. No, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't. All right. Well, they're probably the tapes probably got flooded in Katrina. Yes. But <laughs> they, yes. they ran those for many years, and that was uh, Don Marshall, who was the, yes. the uh, director of Le Petit Theater. He said to he saw me out performing all the time. He said, Carl, why don't you put a show together? I'll give you the theater. Uh, you can have it for free, and uh, gather up all these street performers and put on a show. So I said, okay. So we went out. The first year they were doing Showboat at Le Petit, so we had a Tuesday night when the theater, when Showboat wasn't on, and it had this beautiful backdrop, you know, and we presented Carl Mack Presents New Vaudeville, and we filmed it, I had a little orchestra on stage, Becky Allen was in it, and uh, all kinds of, Jose Torres Tom, all kinds of local entertainers. And very I just, similar to something that you participated in very recently. That's at, right. At Harrah's, That's right. right, just like that. Yep. Okay. Uh, impresario of talent. All right. And uh, so, uh, but we filmed it and we made episodes and I did it for a couple of years. And uh, people started seeing me as like a, a go-to person if they wanted to book something. So then in, I would say, um, uh, 15 years ago, <clears throat> realized that we need costumes to put all these in because you need quality control. You know, you can't just be sending out somebody and they don't have a proper costume. Um, so, and I just, um, I had met a, my partner at the time was a costume designer. Didn't know that when, he, when we met, but soon became evident that he could do all that stuff. He ended up quitting his job, and uh, Ty Johnson, and working for me, working together with his talent for costume making and, and my talent for booking entertainment. And um, here we are now today, we're uh, in for the French Quarter with a it's five, about 5,000 square foot store with thousands of costumes, um, eight people on staff, booking entertainment, um, costuming yeah. people, you know, and um, it's, when, it's grown and grown. We do. When I recently uh, had an opportunity to come see your place, I didn't even know it existed in the French Quarter, but I was overwhelmed and I tell people that you have acres of costumes. It is, I think the people should know that you walk in there and you will see people at a sewing machine, someone with an ironing board, and, and apparently you have everything so well organized that you can find a particular kind of costume fairly readily. Now, we're not talking about Halloween costumes. We are talking about elaborate, beautiful, ball-type costumes is what I, what I have seen there. Uh, you've got things other than that. And it's not just the gowns and the men's clothes. You've got headgear and boots and shoes. And, and you also say, if we don't have the costume you need, we'll make it for you, right? That's true, that's true. But I'm telling you, I was so impressed just walking through your place that it is, I think it should be a, a, a part of a French Quarter walking tour because it is, it is overwhelming, it really is, Carl. 
and I congratulate you on on uh, having blossomed from uh, being a, a a street street artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, in addition to renting. And I guess do you also sell costumes or just rent them? We sell just a custom costume. Like if somebody comes in uh, and needs a costume made. Yeah, and you will um, make it for them yeah. and, they, and, pay, and they, they pay you, to, they buy it. Well, I'm looking at material that I gathered about you and it says here, <clears throat> Carl Mack Presents, which is the name of your operation, not only specializes in unique costume rentals, but is also a talent and entertainment agency. The agent is the uh, uh, preferred talent, ve talent vendor to all local major destination management companies and also the New Orleans Hornets and the House of Blues. Entertainers include aerialists, stilt walkers, magicians, and airbrush tattoo artists, and many more. Do you have lots of calls for, for those exotic kind of things? All the time. All the time. And we're always coming up with new things, too. I mean, I would, I would say, I like my, just for example, our price list, you know, is 35 pages long. Because there's everything we've done Cajun crab racing, and uh, you, you know, just no matter what it is, uh, we've 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 done it. We we probably do ten events a week, whether it's a couple psychics, or a band, or a DJ here to complicated, elaborate parties. We've taken things to Las Vegas. It's it's become a big show company. Well, I can see that it would be. You know, is is your primary interest then in in the costumes or in the talents? Well, I think my pr I, I would have to say my primary interest is that no matter what the request is, that we do an excellent job with it, that all the details are in place. Um, that's my primary interest. There's nothing worse than having um, get to a job and you've only got a right-handed glove and you've left the left one at home. <laughs> you've got to watch every little yeah. detail and, and organize the people and their, their drama of going through traffic and getting there on time and, and you know, getting them to the store to dress. Um, that's yes. the nice thing with the French Quarter location. The entertainers all meet at my store and we can just walk over to the Hilton or the Marriott or the Sheraton yes. the aquarium well, and party rooms and things I like have, that. Uh, I have observed a lot of efficiency in what you're doing there. Now, a little bit aside from that, you are a drummer and a xylophone player, and I did attend a musical performance at, at City Park, and you were a part of what is what what is that musical group that you're a part of there? Right. That's the New Leviathan Oriental Foxtrot Orchestra. Oh, I see, and so they perform not just that one show that I went to, but they do give regular performances. Well, yeah, we probably do um, a job a month. Uh, private parties. Uh, we, we show up at a lot of galas, fundraisers. Um, we're playing in two nights from now. Uh, we're doing a Twelfth Night Ball, uh -huh. um, providing the entertainment. And I joined them in 1991 as the drummer. Uh, you're the drummer there, yes. not not the xylophone or. I play bells with the right hand. I play the, okay. the bells and drums with the but, left hand. But, you're, but the, it takes you back to your original skill, which was drumming. Right. All right. You just mentioned something I'd like to hear a little more about. The Twelfth Night Ball. What is that? Well, as, as you know, there's 12 nights of Christmas. Uh, last night on the Twelfth Night is um, representative in, of when the wise men found the baby Jesus, and that gave rise to the king cakes and all that, and that's what they call the Epiphany. All and right. so we're celebrating Twelfth Night. Um, and we're trying something new. I'm a member of the crew of Satyricon, uh, okay. Carnival Ball, Carnival Crew. And um, so we were at a meeting a few months ago, and we were planning the Twelfth Night Ball, and the big discussion was, should we, it falls on a Wednesday, what are we going to do? Should we have it the Saturday before? Should we have it the Saturday after? And I was, just kept saying, why would you want, if it's Twelfth Night, it's Twelfth Night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not Fifteenth Night or Ninth Night, right. it's Twelfth Night. So it um, happened to fall on a Wednesday, which is the night that we rehearse 
the new Leviathan Oriental Foxtrot Orchestra always rehearses on Wednesday. So I said, you know, I got an idea. Let me go ask the orchestra if instead of showing up in the rehearsal hall, as always, why don't we just put on our tuxedos and, and go, go make a party of a 12th night? Um, so we, we're trying it at Cafe Istanbul this week. It'll be All our, right. Now, what, other than, than the orchestra, what else takes place at that ball? The, um, there is a drawing to see who's going to be 12th night king and 12th night queen. There's, and then they get to appear in the, in the ball tableau later in January. Um, but then also the new incoming royalty is announced, who's going to be the upcoming king and queen. Of what? The mystic crew of Satyricon. Of Satyricon, all right. So since we do have established that Satyricon is the, what, the sponsor of the 12th yes. Night Ball, mm -hmm. and that you are, a, 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 I think, a long-standing member of Satyricon, and uh, is it uh, is it a secret who uh, about who who becomes king and queen? Is that something that remains? It's a secret until Twelfth Night. Uh, well, it's it's kind of a secret. I mean, some people know. Um, All right. The current king and queen is Marshall Harris and Becky Allen. Yes. Well, I'm well acquainted with your current king and queen, who have reigned during the year 2015. And I can say they have made the most of their royalty. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but at the so the next satiricon ball, which is in what in January, or when it's going to be Friday, January twenty second. That's the that's your annual ball, and so then the uh, last last year's king and queen that will be their last performance as royalty. Right, and new ones will come in. Mm -hmm. You're involved in preparations for that whole event, I understand. Oh, yes. Well, um, by the time this airs, you know, the queen will be announced and uh, the king as well. And so, yes, I'm very involved. All right. That. So it's, it's fair to say that uh, the new king and queen will be you and your partner. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I know if anybody in this city can put on a good ball, you can. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, we've got, I've been pulling the, I have three or four costume racks of everything pulled. Um, I'm costuming a large part of the ball. All right. Now, this is open to the public, right? Yes, it is. Uh, we, the balcony seats, the, the balcony seats are $20 at the door, and we have 700 seats, so everybody's so, welcome to attend. All right. It's Friday, so, January 22nd. So, uh, someone may not have seen prior years satiricon balls, but I think you're saying that uh, this might be a special one. And you will, I presume, let the public know how to get tickets, which we won't talk about now because we can't, can't sell things okay. on this show. Okay. But there will be opportunity for people to, mm -hmm. to come see that, that, that yeah. ball yeah, the, uh, in January. The, the table seatings at these balls are, are limited because they're by invitation, but yes. the balcony seating is uh, unlimited. Okay, well, I did attend last year's ball and uh, I was impressed. Uh, well, tell me, uh, Carl, uh, have we, have, are, there, are there things I have not covered that you would really like to, uh, to uh, tell our listeners about? Well, um, I think New Orleans um, is just a, an absolutely wonderful place to spur creativity. I just, I, in other cities, there isn't the creative spark here, you know, and as, as there is here. <clears throat> I always get distressed when I see um, people wanting to shut down the street performers on the, in the French Quarter, you know. That's um, a, there was and, a and recent would, effort to do that. Right, and I would say, you know, I'm living testimony to the benefit of street performing, because had that opportunity not been there, um, a lot of what, what's happened for me in my life probably would not have occurred, as well as all those people who I employ. We employ hundreds of, of entertainers all year long. And um, it all started from taking a xylophone out on the street. What is the present status of that effort of some merchants to, to uh, get, rid of, get rid of the pedestrian mall and the entertainers? How, how does that stand? 
Um, it would take a lot to change it, I, I believe. Um, I was on the committee, I, would, I think it was about 1991, myself, Jackie Clarkson, um, from the police department, and a couple other interchanges. There was about 12 of us that wrote, came up after many, many meetings, because this, is, this was an issue back then, too. And we came up with the diagram that says uh, where on the square there could be performers, where there'd be uh, artists on the wall, and what times of day they need to shut down and out of courtesy for the church, and, and so forth. And in this most recent one, I think it was just that um, they, uh, they, they stopped having the pedestrian mall on Royal Street, and the merchants liked it. And they, they, some got vocal saying, why don't you move them all like to Armstrong Park? But I think what they're blind to is um, other cities like San Diego's Gas Lamp District. They yeah. would love to have performers out there and all these people. If, I mean, if you moved all the entertainers to Armstrong Park and if the tourists all went to Armstrong Park, they'd be crying that there's nobody exactly. on Royal Street. Well, I spent a large part of my working life with Nahan Galleries on Royal Street. Uh, and, uh, and I was the first president and one of the founders of the French Quarter Business Association, uh, we never had a problem with, with the uh, entertainers on the street. Uh, I don't know why this particular group, which is just the 400 block, I think, of, of Royal, decided that uh, they wanted to change. I don't know what brought that about, but it's your opinion that there will no be change, not be a change. I don't think so. You know, maybe what they could do out of uh, to balance it between any complaints the merchants have and the performers is to review what we wrote back in the 90s because a lot of this stuff was already dealt with and covered in terms of volume, uh, hours of operation, yes. things like that. So they, maybe they're just not seeing what's, what we already did. Carl, uh, we've got a minute or so left. You want to tell the people how to get in touch with you? Your your uh, your organization. Sure. sure. Um, you can uh, find my uh, Facebook page, carlmack.com. Uh, Carl Mack on Facebook. Also, our main website is carlmack.com. C A R L M A C K dot com. And our store is at 318 North Rampart Street, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. Well, that's. Covers it, I think, and I do want to really thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And I just want to repeat that I have been so impressed with your facilities. And you did tell me when I was there that this enormous area that I saw, that you have another another warehouse we have, also quite oh, large. Yeah. We have things stored in several locations. Well, I would hate to be the person who has to take the inventory. <laughs> But uh, thank you again, Carl, and I want to thank you folks who watch our show and hope that you will continue to do so.